My name is Michelle Dedeo, and thank you for attending my talk, The Rule of 77, Making Decisions. In finance, we've all heard about the rule of 72. In medicine, the rule of nines. And Pareto's rule of 80-20, where generally 80% of the results will come from just 20% of the work. I would like to suggest an aphorism or rule to live by, the rule of 77. But before we go and talk about the rule, let's talk about where it came from. Data science is an interdisciplinary field that includes statistics, predictive analytics, and machine learning. It's a combination of the study of where information comes from, what it represents, and how it can be turned into a valuable resource for your decision making. The idea of data science is to use data experiments in order to reveal hidden patterns and dependencies and then to act on them. Both data science and big data fall under the umbrella of the data driven decision process and involves four different stages. First, you must capture the data. Then, process and store the data, which is what I would call big data. Then analyze and generate insights, which is data science. And then lastly, translate that into decisions and actions. Now, it's this last part of the process, decisions and actions, that is vastly overlooked in the data science process. Now, I could go on to why I prefer Jump to Python or Tableau to Google API, or I could tell you the pros and cons of Microsoft Azure versus Amazon Web Services. But there are thousands, if not millions, of articles out there that can tell you about the tools required for the first three steps of the data decision process. But there are very few that look into the last one, decisions and actions. One reason that decisions and actions is overlooked is that data science is the confluence of three main areas, computer science, statistics, and domain or area specific knowledge. Making decisions and taking action are vastly different depending on which domain we're in. Even within the same department at a particular company such as corporate finance at Citibank, or cardiology at Mayo Clinic, there is no one-size-fits-all way of making decisions and taking action. But I believe there is an overarching commonality that could act as a touchstone or a starting point for which many decisions could be based in life, in education, and in business. As an educator, a student, a clinician, a business leader, whatever walk of life you're in, we'd all love to have 100% of our decisions be correct. As a student, we'd be confident in our studies that we were on the right career path. As a business owner, we'd be confident in the profitability of our businesses. In general, we'd be confident in all of our directives, all of our calls to action. If life had blinking signs that read, go this way to success, we'd follow them. But signs and signals like that rarely happen in the real world. The real world is messy. Despite the best efforts of our brains to create order from the chaos, we get stuck. Many times that messiness leads to stress, indecision, procrastination, and those derailments magnify the farther out we go from taking action, much less making a decision in the first place. We sometimes give ourselves excuses for not making those decisions. We may rationalize that with time, we'll gather more data to make a more informed decision. Or we may not trust the data. In today's world, we are inundated by statements of mistrust. In some instances, this is a good thing because it forces the addition of conditionals and caveats to be explicitly stated along with statements of fact. And that not only helps the reader trust the data, but helps the reader understand the limitations of that data. And if those conditionals are not included, we need to be proactive in asking. But 
Trust in data is another talk. So let's assume we trust the data we have from mundane decisions such as circling a parking lot looking for the best parking space to deciding a response to a terrorist threat. The real world does not always give us time. Decisions must be made. Inaction or the inability to accept hard truth can lead to failure. And as I quote from one of my favorite songs, if you choose not to decide, you still have made a choice. Now, even when we have data, we don't tend to make the best decisions. In 2017, I read an article published in the Harvard Business Review entitled Linear Thinking in a Nonlinear World. In it, the author state, in business, there are many highly nonlinear relationships, and we need to recognize when they're in play. This is true for generalists and specialists alike, because even experts who are aware of nonlinearity in their fields can fail to take it into account and default instead to relying on their gut. But when people do that, they often end up making poor decisions. Over the past 20 years, data science has tried to create order out of that messiness. Now, the term data science, which was first coined less than 20 years ago and has exploded in the past decade, has been catapulted by the need of people, both individually and in teams, to analyze data that has been collected and to make decisions. Right now, we're living in a chaotic world that has made us question the models that we have used to make decisions in the past. We sense that feeling that in chaos, there is opportunity, as originally expressed over 2,000 years ago by Sun Tzu in The Art of War. And I think we can all agree that one way to turn chaos into opportunity is through the use of data. But regardless of how you define data science, the final question is this, at what point are we confident enough to proceed with a decision? And I'm not talking about confidence intervals or p-values, which are both highly misunderstood and misused, but that's another talk. Imagine you were given that big blinking sign that said, go this way. And you knew that that sign was correct 77% of the time or more. Would you proceed with the decision to go in that direction? Now, before you answer, you may ask, well, it depends on the consequences of that decision. So let's say the consequences is that no one is hurt physically. This is not the trolley problem in ethics where you have to decide whether you would kill one person to save five or any of its fascinating variations, but there may be financial consequences. This decision could range from choosing a parking space to continuing on a certain career path to making a business decision that could have far-reaching consequences. If you're a student, what if the sign signaled 77% or more confidence that you were on the right career path? As a data scientist, that results based on your project would, would result in a positive change for your company. As a business manager or owner, that you were at least 77% sure that the decision would result in profits. My answer is that you'd probably take it. Now, given the uncertainty in today's world, you'd probably be very happy with 77% or more confidence in your decisions. This is especially relevant in our new normal. And what is the new normal? Well, in our daily lives, we can probably list the changes that have been made to our routines, but how do we define or explain what happened? We can actually define it with an analogy from machine learning. So machine learning or ML takes data, trains data on a model, and then tests that model. This is something that our brains have been doing and keep doing our entire lives. If the model looks good, then we can use it for future decisions and expectations. Now, many models can be overfit, meaning that it works great on the test data but has no relation to the data going forward. And that's analogous to what COVID-19 has done to our lives. Our model is overfit and the data does not fit the model going forward. Thus, 
we're less confident that the models that we have lived by, whether in business or in our daily lives, still work. My response to this is the rule of 77. It's a rule of acceptance and confidence that we can help move decisions forward, whether they be in business or in life. Now, the rule of 77 has several assumptions. The first is that it's not a hard line. That means a value in the neighborhood of 77 falls within the rule of 77, or whatever threshold you believe is the threshold you should have is your rule of 77. Make it the rule of 66 or the rule of 80, but there has to be a starting point. Second, anything greater than 77 is icing on the cake. It gives us more confidence in our decision. So in math speak, 77 is a lower bound. And it is a starting point. It's a touchstone to begin to answer questions and open up conversations about data and taking action. So let's look into several examples and show how it applies. My first example is how the rule of 77 applies to student success. In June, Science Advances published an article by Harris et al. entitled, Reducing Achievement Gaps in Undergraduate General Chemistry Could Lift Underrepresented Students into a Hyper-Persistent Zone. They studied over 25,000 students over a 15-year period in general chemistry at the University of Washington. Now, general chemistry has a terrible reputation on most college campuses. It's seen as a killer, a place where dreams of careers in STEM go to die. It's well known that students from underrepresented groups start college with the same level of interest in STEM as their peers, but leave STEM at higher rates. The study found that students are more likely than their peers to persist if they earned a C plus or better in the class. They found that the range of grades just above a C appear to encourage both women and underrepresented minorities to stick with STEM track courses at a higher rate than their white and Asian male peers. The students hyper persisted. As one of the authors stated, they have grit. These slightly encouraging grades seems to have made the students especially persistent. And what is a C plus? It's 77%. For me, that says the rule of 77. Now, you may say it's a coincidence, just one example, but let me propose an even bolder statement. We are institutionalized with the rule of 77, and I don't mean that in a bad way. Most everyone attends school for a minimum of 12 years, some of us for much longer. A grade of 77% or C plus is that line between passing and passing with hope. That influence from our K through 12 years has become ingrained in our psyches. That leads me to a book by Dr. Wendy Mogul entitled, The Blessing of a B Minus. Now, Dr. Mogul is a social clinical psychologist who writes about her life changing from what she calls a pleasant choreography to unrelenting power struggles with her children as they grew from adolescence into their teen years. As an aside, after reading a few chapters, I found myself relating to her anecdotes and felt empowered by her methodology as I too have what I will refer to as a teen who shall not be named. Hopefully you get the reference. I would like to crib from her title and suggest that given the results of the extensive study from UW, academics and universities might consider a new mantra, the blessing of a C plus. And I suggest that if you are at a university that is struggling with retention, that you analyze your own school's data and see if your university has a similar trend. Regardless of the results, you have asked a very important question and you now have the data to empower your decisions going forward. My second example is in machine learning. In machine learning, performance measurement is an essential task to determining whether an algorithm performs well. For example, when it comes to a multi-class classification problem, 
we can count on what's called an AUC ROC curve. It's also written as ARA, ARA under the receiver operating characteristics. It is one of the most important evaluation metrics for checking any machine learning classification model's performance. The ROC is a probability curve and AUC represents the degree or measure of separability. It tells us how much a model is capable of distinguishing between classes. The higher the AUC, the better the model is at predicting zeros as zeros and ones as ones. By analogy, the higher the AUC, the better the model is at distinguishing between patients who have disease and those with no disease. Now, if the area under the curve is 0.5 or 50%, then that indicates that classifier performs no better than random guessing or flipping a coin, as 100% is perfect. AUC is useful because it provides a single number that lets you compare classification models of different types. When you train a classifier using automated machine learning or AutoML, you have to set criterion. My suggestion is that you set a primary metric like AUC or AUC weighted to 0.77 or 77%. Depending on your data set, a model with 77% accuracy might be less than optimal, but it's a great starting point for training your model in machine learning. Personally, I like Microsoft Azure because you can compare algorithms like comparing whether a boosted decision tree outperforms a neural net regression algorithm with very little effort. And I'm always a fan of work smarter, not harder, as long as you know the trade-offs. Now, let's get into the business side of things and see how the rule of 77 can apply. In particular, let's explore how traumatic events such as the Great Recession, natural disasters, and COVID-19 have altered two real businesses here in Florida. The first business, started during the Great Recession, manufactures and sells large equipment with sales throughout the US and eventually worldwide. Starting from scratch in 2009, the business grew to be the third largest of its type in the world within five years. Sounds fantastic, right? Well, the officers were working 60, 70 plus hours a week, and as the business grew, costs grew. In addition to startup costs, any potential profits were slowly being eaten away by rising material costs and additional labor costs. And being a startup business, the officers paid themselves as little as possible. In addition, their business was seasonal with winter sales being slower. So they were always adjusting their finances to a cyclical way. But there was a light at the end of the tunnel. In 2018, they had created an entirely new, unique product that solved many other companies' problems. By early 2019, they had serious interest from several multi-billion dollar companies. The owners knew that leasing the new equipment instead of selling it outright would create a cash flow throughout the year and help the company move solidly into the black. And then Hurricane Michael hit. Although not substantially impacted by the storm itself, the facility had to close for a week to prepare and ride out the storm. But that one week changed the company forever. That week forced the officers to take a breath and reassess their finances and their position. And they reassessed by applying the rule of 77. The first question I asked was, if sales dropped by 77% of last year's, would the doors still be open? Looking at the PL, the profit and loss sheet, the answer was an obvious no. I kept asking, and there was a long list of questions, but the answer to each question I asked was no. That was very hard for them to come to terms with. But the realization and acceptance of the data caused the officers to make some drastic decisions 
to their business model. Within two months, they had switched to being a seasonal employer. In doing so, they shifted from manufacturing themselves during the winter to outsourcing from a trusted vendor. And they closed their facility over the winter and cut back on their staff by 80%. It was a drastic move. Now, what about those high dollar contracts? Well, they were still being negotiated. Contracts and leases were being sent back and forth for final approval. Equipment was still being sold and it was expected their facility would reopen in the spring to start building the new equipment that was leased on those contracts. Hopes were very high. That guaranteed revenue stream from leasing was the solution to skyrocket their business to the next level. Even when sales dropped over the winter, and sales did not drop to 77% of their previous year's levels, they dropped to 20% of the previous years. But it was still okay. By making the drastic decisions and acting on them, when they did, they saved their business. On top of that, they went from being 12% in the red to a net zero. Net zero, no profits? Well, for them, net zero was manageable. They weren't losing money anymore and things were good. The financial and mental stress was off. They were open. Business was still flowing. They were working a fraction of the hours they had before and they had these large contracts on the horizon. They were really in a very good place. Then literally, the week before they were planning on reopening, COVID-19 hit. All of those contracts were put on hold instantly. Although disappointing and shocking, as of today, everything is okay for them. They're still in business. They're still making sales. And because of the decisions they made, they are now in the black. So by making a decision based on the rule of 77, they survived and now are poised to adapt down the road. They're riding out the current wave of uncertainty with confidence. Now, the second business we're gonna talk about is a retail store that opened in 1995. For many years, it hummed along nicely until the Great Recession hit. But because it sold non-expiring, non-seasonal goods and had reasonably a low overhead, it could survive by ordering only what it absolutely needed. Although sales dipped and literally thousands of other stores, vendors, and manufacturers in their sector closed, never to reopen, they survived. As the years went by and the Great Recession dropped further into their rear view, consumer confidence went up and sales increased. For them, all was great in the world. Every year, the owners would ask the same question. If sales decreased to 77% of last year's, would our doors still be open? 77% was their safety net. And every year, the answer was a resounding yes. Although their cost of goods rose and some of their costs of goods increased by 100%, as of 2020, their fixed costs had kept them at a lower bound of actually 50% of current sales. So 77 was a very safe safety net for them. In fact, they had such great confidence in their sales that after Valentine's Day this year, they started expanding into the retail space next to them. And then we all know what happened a few weeks later, COVID-19. Complete and utter uncertainty hit, mentally, physically, and financially. Who knew what was gonna happen? Now, the officers knew that the store was on solid ground for the moment. They could pay rent, utilities, and other fixed costs, at least for a while. Employees, some of who had been with the company for over a decade, would be accommodated as best as possible. The officers took it month by month. One month went by, two, then three. 
The store adapted to the needs of the community and a funny thing happened. Sales, when they looked back, were actually up compared to the previous year. And they were not alone in their industry. Over the summer, a survey of similar sized retailers in their industry indicated that two thirds of their industry also experienced an increase of year to date sales. And that trend is still going on as of this month. And there's no obvious explanation. But it is in this moment that we must apply the rule of 77 more strictly than ever. It is more likely that this effect is artificially created and unsustainable, that there will be a corruption of some sort, either in sales or cost of goods or both. And they have prepared for that correction. For them, they're applying the rule of 77 to either the lesser of their current year's numbers or last year's numbers, then using those numbers as a benchmark to make decisions. Now, there are numerous ways of applying the rule of 77 to businesses. And again, the rule is simply meant to be a starting point. But here's a few go-tos that I recommend. We first took 77% of current sales as a starting point. Then ask, what if the business only had 77% of your current vendors, 77% of your employees, or could only be open 77% of the time. What would have to change? How would you adapt? Would your doors still be open? And remember, 77 is just a starting point. Make up your own threshold and then start to ask the questions. Questions like these open up topics for discussion and help your company make decisions. Whether it's simply creating a backup plan or several plans, or helping you realize that you need to completely change your business model, asking the questions is the first step. These questions can also be asked in your personal lives. What if you only had 77% of your current salary or 77% of your free time because you had to care for an alien relative or 77% of your retirement because the markets crashed? That hits closer to home and starts to become uncomfortable. But these hard questions are ones you should visit regularly to gauge your own financial health and your personal well being. And you can do this in a positive light. You can flip the script and ask yourself what if I cut my expenses to 77% of current? I personally have done this just by not eating out tried to eat better food 77% of the time, or use electronics 77% less outside of work. As we've seen from the examples I've presented, not all actions made from hard decisions result in negative outcomes. In fact, there can be relief, whether conscious or subconscious, in recognizing, acknowledging, and possibly taking action based on the data gained by asking these questions. And sometimes we'll make the wrong decision, despite the fact it was based on data. As we all know, not all decisions we make have signs saying, go this way. But these questions can lead to success. The highly prolific TV producer, Aaron Spelling, was once asked, how are you so successful? As a producer, he was pitched thousands of ideas Pursuing even one of those ideas could cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. His answer was simple. He said, if an idea looks successful, we went with it. But, and this is the most important part, if it wasn't, we dropped it and that was that. We never looked back. We kept going forward. As hard as it can be at times, moving forward and not dwelling on decisions we've made is a very important aspect of the decision-making process, both in business and in our daily lives. The best we can do is to try to learn from it. And so I will end with an homage to the extraordinary Neil Peart's lyrics. If you choose not to decide, if you choose not to ask the question, and if you choose not to answer the question, you still have made a choice. 
Thank you for your time. And I hope you've enjoyed this talk.